Hello, this is Telecom TV reporting from Paris. We are at the MPLS, SDN and NFV World Congress 2016 and I'm talking with Chris Emmons who is Director of Network Planning at Verizon. Chris, welcome and thanks for talking to us. Verizon, a huge US service provider, operator of great standing. Mm -hmm. um, one of two of the biggest in the country and therefore in the world. We can, mustn't forget the other one, we won't mention it, but we mustn't forget it. Um, you're here at the show and you are, have been talking about the progress that Verizon is making in the introduction, the commercial introduction of NFV. You're talking about practical implementation. So tell us about what you've been doing and tell us also about where you found any particular problems or pitfalls you weren't expecting. Hmm. So we've, uh, over the last um, 18 months or so, really uh, dedicated ourselves to, to developing a common platform for the, for the company and then uh, you know, bringing about, moving from the POC uh, phase to the production deployment phase. So at this point, um, we've designed our, our f first uh, NFVI, uh, the, the infrastructure itself. We've deployed that in um, five data centers domestically now, and we're mm -hmm. looking at a couple of international locations as well to serve our enterprise customers. Um, th those data centers are up and running. We've got uh, our first couple of applications running in those data centers. So uh, it's been an interesting journey. We've uh, <laughs> we've learned a lot both technically, uh, you know, taking kind of the latest and greatest of OpenStack and and some of the SDN technologies that are out there for the data center network, <clears throat> and deploying them in. Uh, in a, in a real production deployment. So kind of working through the, 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 the finer points of turning it up and upgrading it and making sure we're, we're staying current with the code and all that kind of uh, challenges. And then, and then additionally, kind of the, um, uh, the organizational challenges and the, the cultural changes that sure. required here as you're trying to take an IT, you know, classically IT technology and, and embed it in the network, you have kind of the, the legacy um, telecom mentality that you have to uh, work through. Absolutely. How is that going? Because one of the things that, and, and I talk a lot about this with people, and this is one subject that comes up time after time, and people say it's much more difficult than they thought it might be, and it's taking longer to push through those organizational changes and, and get buy-in and acceptance of it and see the changes actually happening. Mm -hmm. Same with Verizon? I, I think you know, probably about the same. I think Verizon took the approach of kind of a broad-based uh, education and, and training to kind of, you know, let our the broader organization know this was coming. You know, we had our, our dedicated teams working on architecture and implementation plans and, and all of that. But then when it comes to actually deploying it and operating it and, and, and providing it to the network, obviously there's a much broader team, engineering operations, uh, you know, <coughs> field force, field folks that need to be... Uh, Involved in that, so we 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 went. We had a campaign of kind of educating, um, you know, the company at large about the changes that are coming. But but even so, you know, when you've built a, a you know a, a company or, or an industry on reliability and and kind of that methodical sure. moving forward, you know, how we've the always five nine mentality exactly. Yeah. Then to try and, and change to a more DevOps mentality, a more you know we're just gonna we're gonna go with this, and if it breaks, we'll fix it on the fly. You know, that's very that's very. Uh, Different non telecoms. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, the times are changing. What about the technology itself? So there's the, the organizational psychology mm -hmm. and the organizational difficulties of pushing it through and making that cultural change. But what about the technology itself? Has it been moderately straightforward to implement? Uh, I would say moderately is a good <laughs> word. There's obviously been challenges. There are things that work very well, uh, kind of the, the generic virtualization. Um, Technologies, you know, creating the VMs and installing the images and things like that work yeah. work fairly straightforward. I think that where we get into the challenges is again the telecom aspect of that. When you're trying to bring the same reliability and and um, deterministic nature of the network that we're all used to in a virtual world, that's where things get get different for us. Uh, you know, see, so we've had to come up with different ways of either caring for that in the infrastructure or procedurally caring for those things. It's just, again, it's a, it's a twist on, on what we're used to. So. Wireless is also massively important to Verizon. 
uh, much talk of 5G, of course. What about the move from um, the move into the wireless arenas with NFV? What, what's happening there? So we're we're pushing ahead. We so Verizon has a plan to virtualize our entire infrastructure yep. for any. Well, I should say anything that um, is forward. So we're not going to virtualize things that are kind of you know. Uh, end of life or um, you know sunsetting, exactly. but anything that we're going to be growing or, or whatever into the future, uh, we have a plan to virtualize. So that's IMS Core, that's Volti, that's uh, EPC, uh, you know all of those uh, elements that we use to bring about our our wireless network, including virtual RAN, um, you know at the edges as well. So as we move to 5G, Verizon's already stated publicly that uh, we expect all of the 5G elements to be virtualized as a starting point. We don't want to start and then have to virtualize. We just want to sure. start <coughs> from the beginning. Virtualize from the start. Right. Okay. Thank you. Now this is a uh, this is a very techy event, small exhibition, but a very big and powerful conference, and a lot of delegates here who are really into heavy technology. It's the MPLS uh, SDN and NFV World Congress, as we've said. Do you think? SDN and NFV, these new technologies are going to transform the network. Do you think it'll make MPLS redundant? Uh, I don't think so. I, I will comment on the, conver on the conference, though. It's interesting that day one was mostly SDN and NFV this year, and MPLS was pushed to day two. So, yeah. um, I don't, I, But I don't think that's a statement necessarily the technology. I mean, MPLS is a core... Uh, transport technology today. I don't. I don't see it going anywhere in the future. Uh, in the immediate future, um, SDN's complementary. NFV, of course, you know, takes advantage of whatever transport you can provide it. <clears throat> the more programmable, i.e., SDN, the transport is, the kind of the more um, you know versatility you have with the NFV itself. But that's not to say you couldn't use NFVs in existing networks today. Exactly, and MPLS is a very robust transport mechanism anyway. So, and tried and tested. Right and widely deployed, and, and we know that those networks are not replaced easily. Exactly. So it's important that SDN and NFE be able to leverage the existing networks while we work out what the future is going to look like. Okay, thanks. One of the most evident uh, things that have happened since NFE was mooted is this concept of openness. In the past, you will know this coming from a uh, service provider background, in the past, service providers have found themselves, around the world, have found themselves locked into various manufacturers and vendors. Uh, certainly it happened in Europe a great deal when we just had, you know, one incumbent telco and that sort of thing. And it happened with Marbell quite a lot in the old days. Um, and the push to SDN and NFE in particular was originated by the service providers on, on, on the notion that we're not going to be locked in to one particular vendor or manufacturer again. Uh, the result of that has been that the vendors and the manufacturers in seeking to win SP business have formed a variety, indeed some would say a plethora, of ecosystems, new ecosystems. Now given that, and I've talked to a lot of service providers who say they're a bit confused about the actual number of these things and what they do, especially given that many of the ecosystems have got exactly the same people and companies in them as the other ones are. So how do they go about, how would you at Verizon go about choosing a transformation partner given that proliferation of ecosystems? Yeah, it's an interesting question. We, we have um, you know, internally debated that quite a bit and we've actually, we've had to sit down and strategically pick those ecosystems that we want to participate in. So OpenStack, for instance, um, uh, uh, NF, um, sorry, Etsy NFV, where Verizon was one of the founding partners of Etsy NFV and, and, and various other, uh, other um, consortiums or whatever. Um, we've also kind of tried to strategically align with some other service providers um, you know, so that we can kind of get um, critical mass behind the ones that we feel are, are the most important because as you've as you mentioned the, the, the it seems like every day a new uh, you know, open source effort or, or whatever pops up which I think is actually good it's good that we're fostering these ideas it's good that a lot of people are thinking and pushing things forward things are going to live or die on their merits I think based on you know who wants to use a particular technology or, or an open source project and uh, you know and, and then we'll see well, it's evident that not all of them are going to survive. They can't. There will be a consolidation of, of some sort. But overall, was it a particularly was it a particularly difficult, not decision, but the process of getting through it, deciding we're going to put our weight behind this because we think this is the most relevant to what we're doing? I think it is. It it, it wasn't easy. Mm. Um, you know, we have to 
we had to make some tough choices where we just don't have the resources. You know, we kind of like to participate in all of them and see where they go, and then you know, kind of steer them where, where we'd like them to end up. But we, you know, again, given limited resources, we've had to, to pick and choose the ones that we've wanted to be involved in. So we've definitely, let, personally, I, I can think of one where I was like, oh, we really should do that. But as a group, we said, we just we can't do that one right now. So we'll keep our eye on it. Well, you know, well, the, the good thing about it is you can always kind of jump in and out. But you can, and it's a pragmatic decision. You have to do what you can do, of course. Absolutely. Final question to you then. It's three and, a, three and a bit years now since NFE burst onto the world stage like Superman. Um, and I, again, speaking to a lot of, of, of manufacturers and vendors, they say, look, it's 2016 now. Um, nothing's happened. We've spent a lot of money on R&D, on NFE and STN, particularly on NFE. We thought we'd be selling kit like mad now into the service providers and we want to make a return on our investment. The service providers say, oh, hang on a second, uh, you know, this is telecoms, we're used to 10 and 15 year procurement cycles and we're moving to NFE, but we're doing it in a measured way. We want to see evidence, genuine evidence, this is working properly before we go to commercial deployments. Um, how long then, given that scenario, how long do you think it will be, Chris, before we see real commercial user cases in NFE widespread? I think we're on the kind of on the on the precipice of that happening. Right. So the since as you mentioned, the last two and a half, three years have been POCs and trials and technology evaluations and, and all that kind of stuff that telecoms need to do. <clears throat> and um, we're so as I mentioned at the beginning, we are deploying now <clears throat> the infrastructure to run um, you know real NFEs in our network and we have plans to virtualize everything in our network. So we are working strategically with our partners as well as some uh, disruptive, you know, our current vendors as well as disruptive uh, yeah. opportunities. And, uh, you know, basically as soon as the, we're at the point now where as soon as the technology or the, the NFV is ready, we think it's, uh, you know, viable for commercial use, we're ready to deploy. So it's, I think we're at that point now, uh, you know, several of our, par of our um, you know, competitors and, and international partners, you know, we've, we've seen that there's a lot of a lot of activity going on and, and you know real world deployments starting I think it has been probably slower than a lot of people would like including our own management they you know we really want they, they want to see the benefits of these technologies so we're at that point now where we're ready to deploy and I think we're ready to start recognizing some of those benefits well it's been great to talk to you and hear from a, a, a major US service provider Chris Emmons thank you very much indeed thank you for having me